community engagement at JTS, and I'm welcoming you today to the last session of our fall series, Six Days Shall You Labor, Perspectives on Work in Jewish Text and Tradition. Um, <clears throat> for me, it's been a really uh, eye-opening semester. Um, I've been reading articles about work and listening to podcasts about work uh, through all kinds of new lenses. I hope it's been enlightening for you too. Um, if anyone does happen to be joining us for the first time today, we welcome you and um, you can access all of the previous webinars and source sheets on, uh, on the series page. <clears throat> Closing our semester for us today is Dr. Alan Cooper, who's the Lane Ravage Professor of Jewish Studies at JTS. Um, with a more meta session on, uh, on work, um, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, our sponsors for today's session, who we're so grateful to, are uh, Yale Aspel, JTS trustee, who is sponsoring at the Navi level, the highest level, and we're so grateful also to our Tzadik level sponsors, Shelley and John Ab Abair, I hope I said that right, in loving memory of Molly Plotka and Revel Smolkin, and with gratitude to the descendants of Shima and Velia Chafetz. Um, thank you so much to the Abair and Asbel um, families for your really generous sponsorship and making today's session possible. Um, we have another wonderful series coming up next uh, semester, as I announced last week. We'll be starting, I believe it's the 24th of January, and we will be um, happily accepting sponsorships for that series as well. So we hope that if you've been inspired by this series, you consider uh, supporting next semester's series as well. Um, and Tani has put information about all of that in the chat. Um, <clears throat> And um, Tani actually uh, lost her voice today, which gives me the perfect opportunity to not only make the announcements she was going to make, but to thank her for um, all of her tremendous work on, uh, on this fall series and all of the preceding series. Um, Tani does an enormous amount of um, interfacing with the faculty, who of course we couldn't do any of this without the faculty, um, but Tani is the one who brings it all together. Um, prepares source sheets and all kinds of behind the scenes things that, um, that we don't think about. So we're so grateful to Tani for making this learning possible. And I also wanna, at the end of the series, express gratitude to Lynn Feynman, who many of you have exchanged emails with. Um, Lynn does an enormous amount of backend work to, uh, to make these series possible as well. So thanks to both of you. All right, so as far as today goes, um, Professor Cooper will pause for questions periodically throughout the class and we'll also have Q&A at the end. And if you would like to submit a question to Dr. Cooper, you should send it to me in the chat, Rabbi Julia Andelman, and I will choose questions from there when we get to Q&A. Um, if you have technical or logistical questions, those you should send via the chat to Tani Schwartz-Herman or Lynn Feynman. Um, we will be sharing a uh, PowerPoint presentation today, and it's also, um, you can find it on the series page as well, and we'll share a link in a little bit too. Um, all right, so let me now introduce uh, Professor Alan Cooper. As I said, he is Elaine Ravitch Professor of Jewish Studies at JTS. He joined the JTS faculty in 1997 um, as Professor of Bible, and he also served as Provost of JTS from um, 2007 to 2018, where he was a really wonderful partner for, um, as we were really expanding our community learning programs. Uh, he also, in 1998, was appointed Professor of Bible at Union Theological Seminary, um, a non-denominational Christian seminary just across Broadway from us here at JTS, uh, becoming the first person to hold concurrent professorships at JTS and Union. Um, his publications include many articles on biblical poets and the history of biblical interpretation, and his work in progress includes a commentary on a selection of psalms for the Jewish Publication Society. Uh, Dr. Cooper, thank you so much for teaching us today. I turn it over to you. Thank you, Rabbi Andelman, and uh, I also would like to echo the thanks that you've already expressed uh, to uh, uh, Lynn and Tani, as well as to yourself. Uh, I also want to extend greetings to all those of you who are uh, spending your afternoons in study with me, uh, and especially I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's session, 
uh, including my good friend, Yale Asfel. I can't see if he's here, but hopefully he is, at least in spirit, if not in body. Uh, I'd like to begin with the bracha, as always. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kiddushanu Mitzvotav V'tzivanu La'asok V'divrei Torah. We thank God for the privilege of being able to sit together and learn to engage in the study of Torah uh, together. In Amen. a world that's so totally messed up, it's amazing that we're able to take this time uh, to learn together. I really appreciated the Community Engagement Department's choice of topic for the semester work for two reasons. First of all, because the uh, media are filled with all sorts of really interesting and sometimes dismaying information about the effects of the pandemic on the concept of work and the reality of work and workplaces and uh, working from home and so forth and so forth. Uh, the very no notions, basic notions of the place of work in one's life, uh, uh, the definition of productivity and so forth. Everything's up for grabs. And I'm sure you've all heard of the great resignation, which uh, has been ongoing since late summer and into early fall, where people are just reconsidering the whole idea of uh, work and how they spend their time and how they allocate their time. I'm going to be talking a bit about that in um, conjunction with the text that we'll be reading together. I also have a personal reason for considering this topic very important is that uh, I grew up in the home of an adamant workaholic, uh, somebody who really knew, knew no boundaries between home and work and uh, for whom work uh, predominated over pretty much any other interest. And so I got to observe that personality type uh, uh, up close and uh, uh, with great love and uh, great respect uh, uh, after the 27th year of his passing, Zichron Bracha, I've kind of gotten used to what I went through when I was a young man. Uh, but we'll um, uh, uh, set that aside. And now what I'd like to do is I'd like to share a screen that has a whole batch of texts on it. As Rabbi Endelman told you, you are able to uh, download these texts in order to peruse them later on, should you wish to, uh, and then begin our discussion of the topics at hand, which focus on a specific uh, uh, short passage in a Mishnaic text that probably most everybody here knows or at least has encountered, namely uh, uh, Pirkei Avot. Uh, what I was uh, brought up to think of as a tra I translate that as the ethics of the fathers or the sayings of the ancestors or the like. And it's a, a pithy collection of apophems that in uh, our tradition, uh, we read one chapter at a time between Pesach and Shavuot, which is how you become accustomed to learning it. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, a couple of Mishnahs, a couple of brief passages here in order to address this concept of work in two respects. So here comes the text that I'll be sharing. And uh, I, let me just move all your nice photo, nice pictures off the screen so I can see my own text. And I hope that the uh, texts are large enough for you to be able to see them. If you have a reasonable size screen, they should be. And so I have two leading questions with which I begin. One is, aside from the question of what's work, specifically, what is the work that we must do, that we should do, that we may do? How do we balance our time within our work lives so that we uh, make the right decisions about priorities. What is it that we should be engaged in or must be engaged in or may be engaged in? And how do we balance those priorities with the other priorities of living, uh, including our family obligations and our other personal interests aside from work? And that brings me then to uh, the two Mishnas uh, that will engage us for the rest of our time. And they come at the end of chapter two of Pirkei Avot, uh, and they are attributed to Rabbi Tarfan. Now, if you were to take the time to peruse 
Avot chapter two, what you'll see is that most of it is devoted to sayings of Yochanan ben Zakkai and his immediate disciples. Uh, and yet, at the end of the sayings that are attributed to Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai's disciples, comes this little appendix, which is attributed to Rabbi Tarfon, who may have belonged to that circle, but was not one of uh, Yochanan ben Zakkai's uh, direct disciples. Oh, here's Rabbi Tarfon. And this is the basis for the title of our talk too. The day is short, Hayom Katser. The work is plentiful, the laborers are indolent, and the reward is great, and the master of the house is insistent. And uh, what happens in uh, so many of the little chapters in Avot is that you get linked sayings, and part of the game, as it were, of interpreting Avot is to try to figure out what the linkage is. In other words, how does each sentence relate to the ones that proceed and follow, and do they all add up to co a coherent statement? Uh, and the continuation in the next Mishnah, he used to say, Lo alecha hamalacha ligmor. It's not up to you to finish the work, but you are not free to neglect it. Lo ata ven chorin libatel mimena. And that, of course, you have to link back to this notion of the master of the house, whatever that means, who is dochek, pressing, insisting on the continuation of the work. And then uh, finally, the, the Mishnah tips its hand and evidently considers the work that's under consideration to be Torah learning. If you have learned much Torah, you will be given much reward. But I'm gonna call that into question and wonder whether these last statements here uh, may be a bit of over-determination or internal interpretation of what might be a more general statement about the nature of work. In time, we'll get there. So one uh, interpretation that struck me as something to bring to you right away is the uh, interpretation of the concept of laziness or indolence. And I love this particular comment which comes from a uh, mystical philosophical type named Shmuel de Ozida or Uzida. Uh, there his name is given with its correct Spanish spelling, uh, although he was a resident of Tzfat, uh, which was first published in 1579. Not too much is known about this guy, except that he wrote a more or less compendious uh, commentary on Avot that uh, includes many citations of earlier commentaries. So this is what's interesting. He, he said, and he's reflecting the language of the Mishnah, the laborers are indolent, not because they're negligent of Torah and indolent idlers on street corners. I love this phrase, Yoshevei Kuranot, which is a, a Talmudic phrase, those sitting on corners. But it, it's just, you know, the, like the guys who used to hang around on the corners singing dua when I was a kid. Uh, and it's just, uh, a wonderful Talmudic phrase to, dis to describe people who hang out in the street but never actually walk into the doors of the Beit Midrash. But rather, even laborers who work diligently on Torah day and night are called indolent relative to what they ought to do. And this impinges right away on the question of my father's behavior and on the question of uh, the general attitude that one has uh, towards work. It's never enough. You've never worked enough hours. You've never worked hard enough. There's always more to do. And uh, that can have a profound effect on people's lives. So he's referring this notion of laziness, not to a general characteristic of personality, but rather to the comparison between what a human being is capable of doing and what needs to be done. And that is a rather poignant thing to be saying about a world in which so much, so very much needs to be done. And people are paralyzed by the thought of all that they have to do uh, to the point that they don't do anything. Later I found, that's Shmuel ben uh, Isaac, continue, uh, Shmuel ben Yitzchak continuing, that Rabbeinu Yona interpreted, and the labors are indolent, with reference to human indolence and blindness to here today, gone tomorrow, 
I couldn't resist importing the English uh, cliche, although what it says is here today and tomorrow in the grave. So life is short and recognize that. Uh, you may know if you've ever looked at the traditional edition of Avot that comes in the giant uh, Vilna Shas, uh, the uh, standard printed edition of the Gemara, uh, that uh, the two commentaries that regularly accompany Avot are Rabbeinu Yonas, Jonah Garandis, and that of Rambam. Uh, and there's a certain irony in that, in that uh, Rabbeinu Yona, who was Spanish but moved to France, was a staunch anti-Maimonidean. He had no use for Maimonides, and uh, some have blamed him for the past several centuries for uh, the burning of the uh, Talmud in Paris, uh, for which he did uh, immense amounts of teshuva. So let's look at him for a moment at Rabbeinu Yona, Jonah Garandi. You can see by his name, he's from Garoni, even though he was functioning in France. And he adduces Moses as the consummate workaholic, paraphrasing a Midrashic tradition that Moses neither ate nor slept when he received the Torah. Uh, and the Midrash is a little bit thorny in Hebrew. So Rabbeinu Yona, who wants to convey this teaching to a more popular audience, uh, has paraphrased it rather than literally quoting it. So Moses didn't sleep the whole time he was on Mount Sinai. And then following the Midrash, he gives the parable, parable of a king who said to his servant, count out gold coins from now until tomorrow and everything that you count out will be yours. How can he sleep? Will he not lose very much at that time? Some of you may be reminded of Tolstoy's famous short story, How Much Land Does a Man Need, uh, in which this fellow is, uh, uh, has to run from his starting place back to the same starting place, and as much ground as he can encompass during that time will be his. So he runs to the max and acquires a tremendous amount of land, and when he arrives at the destination, he drops dead. Uh, so the question of how much man, land does a man need is answered by the six feet that it takes to bury him. Will he not lose very much at that time? So Moses said, if I sleep, how many pearls of Torah will I miss? How much more so for us? We should not give sleep to our eyes nor slumber to our eyelids, alluding to a couple of famous phrases from biblical poetry. Uh, and this represents a highly traditional attitude towards what the work is that we're supposed to be engaged in. And that is to say 24 seven morning till night Torah study, which will never be enough, but uh, for which will accrue some minor share of uh, benefit that we can take with us into the next world, or as the Mishnah says, that will await us when we arrive in the next world. Uh, this is probably not a healthy attitude towards work. Uh, that one should spend 40 days and 40 nights without any sleep. Now I'd like to talk about the two principal words for work. You may have heard about this already during the course of your study in this session, particularly from biblical scholars, uh, but I wanna do it in the context of studying our Mishnah. So here are two excerpts from the writings of Abraham Badursi. This is not the famous Badursi. I love saying that because most people have no idea who the other Badursis are. Uh, but uh, you can see that the, uh, uh, he's Provencal and by his name, Badursi, you can tell that he came from Bézier. And he is a, a remarkable figure in Jewish uh, history because he's the first person who ever wrote a dictionary of Jewish syn synonyms which became a relatively popular genre up right in, into the 20th century. You know that uh, according to uh, rabbinic hermeneutics theory of interpretation, uh, the, uh, there's no true synonymy in biblical Hebrew. That is to say, if you have all these different words for sin, like chet and avera and avon and pesha and so forth, each one must have a different nuance of meaning. And so it is with the words for work and the two principal words, of course, are avodah and malacha. And here's uh, Abraham Badursi, again, the 13th century, the first biblical synonym dictionary. The meaning of avodah with respect to humans relates to difficulty and exertion, koshi and, and perech. 
And then he cites the obvious texts, the prophecy to Abraham that the Israelites will be uh, enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. And then the law of the affliction of uh, uh, indentured servants. Don't subject your Hebrew Jewish indentured servant to the treatment of a slave. So uh, don't treat this person like an Eved, meaning that you can work their fingers to the bone. Malacha, he says, is an activity that is concrete and specific. In other words, it, it is uh, a kind of workmanship or craftsmanship that yields a product that was manufactured for a specific purpose. Uh, and he uses really interesting Hebrew words, mamashit, uh, actuality, and yeshut, which I would translate um, uh, as equity, the thingness of the thing. That is to say the uh, uh, essential characteristic of the thing, something that's necessary that you need. Uh, so the scut work of schlepping the mish mishkan, the tabernacle around would be avodah, it's hard work. Uh, but the manufacture of the component parts of the tabernacle would be malacha, skilled craftsmanship or workmanship that would yield the specific result of the products that are necessary for the mishkan. Okay. And <clears throat> if you, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the proof is on the seventh day, God finished the work, the malacha that he had been doing. And what could be a better example of exquisite craftsmanship uh, for a specific purpose than the world itself. Moving forward to the 19th century, another uh, expert in the area of biblical synonymy, this is a great uh, 19th century rabbi and commentator, Malbim. And here he's talking about the terminology again. He echoes the Chotam Tokhni, any project in which people are engaged to make something necessary for a specific purpose is called malacha. And just keep in mind, we'll come back to this in a moment, that malacha is the term that's used in our Mishnahs, right? Lo alecha ha malacha, ligmor. And uh, so we're not talking about scut work there, but we could be talking about workmanship, craftsmanship, or skilled work, which could involve all sorts of uh, uh, techniques and all sorts of goals. And then uh, Malbim continues to tell us when it is particularly ar arduous, and when it really requires bodily exertion, hard labor, then it's called and if you're familiar with the laws governing what we're allowed to do and not allowed to do on Sabbath and holidays, then you're used to the phrase you must not engage in any of this arduous labor, even if it has this goal of achieving through workmanship and craftsmanship a specific purpose. The compound, he says, refers mainly to the toil of agricultural work or the like, or malacha, that ordinarily would be accomplished, accomplished by means of servants. You can give that some thought about the nature of work and who does the work and who was commissioned to do the work and who in biblical times would have been enslaved or indentured in order to do the work. In Avod, Avodah occurs twice. And this will bring us back to the biblical usages of Avodah uh, because in both cases, it connotes religious activity. And yeah, I bet almost everybody here knows this famous Mishnah from the very beginning of the first chapter of Avot. Al Shosha Devarim Haolam Omeid. You can probably sing it, uh, but I'm not getting paid enough to do the musical rendition of it right now. Al Shosha Devarim Haolam Omeid. Al HaTorah. The Al HaAvodah. The Al Gimilud Chasadim. And I don't want to dwell too much on the uh, translation of these terms, which is subject to an enormous amount of uh, literature and commentary. And the three things on which the world stands are the Torah, avodah, which just means service, the right labor, which we know, but which is universally understood to be the temple service, and on gratuitous kindness. Some people use translations like acts of piety or refer specifically to charity, but I would say that gratuitous and kindness is a more general way of encompassing all those things that we graciously do 
on behalf of other people. So here's Rambam talking about Avodah and giving it the interpretation that we are so familiar with. Bishmirat mitzvata Torah, mitzvot Torah, hema korbanot. So Avodah is observance of the commandments, specifically the sacrifices. So that's one of the bases for the interpretation of Avodah as specifically temple service. Uh, and thus Avodah itself takes on a religious connotation. And you could say uh, in very, very schematic terms that Avodah means religious service and Malacha means any skilled workmanship or the like, uh, including uh, Malacha, as it says in the first footnote, the uh, product of uh, production that's executed with skill and workmanship. Uh, exile occurs on account of idolaters. That's the other use of the uh, term avodah. And obviously, once again, the term has a religious connotation, galut ba'al olam al ovedei avodah zara. So avodah zara, it's not Illicit worship, it's not temple service, it's the contrary, it's the contrary type, it's illicit worship, but it still carries a strong religious valence. Uh, I'm going to say a couple of things about malacha and then break for your questions and comments in a moment. The term malacha occurs four times in Avot, and it clearly connotes activity outside the sphere of religious observance in at least two cases. So here are the two cases in question. Shemaya used to say, Ehov et hamalacha usna et harabanut ve'al titvada l'arashut. I'm just going to leave it in Hebrew and I should X out the translation. Every single word of that is uh, controversial and subject to much debate. One thing I, I want to uh, point you, you, your attention to is the uh, commentary of uh, Bartonura better Ovadia de Bertinoro, uh, that uh, even if you have enough to live on, you're obligated to work for idleness leads to boredom. And that's another thought that uh, should be occurring to people uh, during the pand pandemic era when one tries to maintain a balance that will enable one to keep one's sanity, uh, sanity and, and, and keep from uh, falling into desuetude, which is what can happen if you're just kind of mired alone uh, without work or without anything to uh, schedule your day or any social encounters that uh, might enliven your proceedings. So love work, and I love that gloss on it, even if you don't have to work. Uh, hate power, uh, and I think that means seeking power on your own behalf. That is to say, don't strive to attain power uh, and steer clear of the authorities. I mean, why mess around if you can just live your life without having anything to do with them? Rabban Gamliel, the son of Yehud Hanasi says, the study of Torah is fine. Yafeh Talmud Torah im Derecheret. Again, one of the most famous statements in Avot. Uh, most people tend to interpret the word derech eretz more specifically in relation to ethics, uh, for two particularly supererogatory ethics, by which I mean ethical behavior towards one's fellows that is not specifically mandated by halacha or by Torah law. Uh, but I think that uh, derech eretz has a more uh, general connotation. This emerges very clearly in the medieval era and uh, most especially uh, well known from the commentaries of Rashbam, Samuel Ben Meir, Rashi's uh, uh, grandson, who uses the term derech eretz all the time to, well, not all the time, but a whole bunch of times in order to um, describe worldly knowledge. And we're coming there, but part of the work-life balance that ultimately we'll come to is the notion that uh, the study of Torah as an obsession like Moses going sleepless for 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai is one way of thinking about what Jews must do, but a kind of combination of Torah study and other forms of intellectual and other activities represents something much finer. 
as long as Torah remains at the heart and as its anchor. Toiling in both, Rabbi Gamliel says, keep sin at bay. Torah that is not combined with worldly knowledge ends up being neglected. Vigoreret avon. It engenders sin. So before going into a deeper consideration of our two Mishnas, I'd like to pause for your questions and comments and turn to Rabbi Andelman. Great, thank you. Um, I love that several of the questions coming in are referring back to previous um, lessons with your colleagues on the faculty. Um, so, all right, um, here's a question. So there, there seems to be, um, there's an interesting kind of layering going on with, with how these sources have defined these two terms, Avodan, Malacha. Um, so Malacha is kind of right, um, I forget what, exactly what you're, the way you articulated it, kind of um, concrete work, right? Um, and, and people have referred to our opening session with Dr. Kramer on the malachot forbidden on, on Shabbat as being oriented towards food, clothing, writing, kind of these core functions of life. And then Avodah straddles it in this funny way. It's kind of low work. It's a, it's the term for, you know, for slavery and servitude. And then it's also the term for worship of God. Um, I mean, it's service, but, but one kind of service is degrading and the other kind of service is, um, is lofty or uplifting. Um, so there's just been, there've been questions sort of, uh, kind of struggling with, with that sandwiching, if that's, um, if that's a reasonable way of articulating it. Oh, that, the way you put it was so brilliant. I mean, you, you, you embedded the answer in your question. <laughs> Uh, because first of all, uh, the relationship between the two is complex and it varies from time to time and from author to author. And obviously the idea that we just tossed out about how, well, Avodah is the stuff you would never do yourself. It's the stuff you would hire a servant for. Uh, and that leads then to uh, another whole layer of questions, which, which is what's the difference between an Eved and a Misharet? What's the difference between somebody who works as an Eved, who could be a slave or an indentured servant, and somebody uh, who is literally a hired, a hired servant or hired to serve in that capacity? And uh, Moses is called both things, of course. So, uh, but but it, it's very hard to pin these terms down exactly. Except that you'll note that the Avot Malacha that Rabbi Kramer discussed the things that are prohibited on, on Sabbath, most often are designed to yield specific results. That is to say, specific re re results in the form of products, which also could be called malacha. Let's keep in mind that a malacha is also the product of the craftsmanship, not just the act of craftsmanship. There are a lot of Hebrew words like that that are um, so striking that people, uh, people tend uh, to ignore. So Malacha has more of a focus on the workmanship and the product. And Avodah has more of a focus on the labor per se. I think that's reasonable. And uh, pinning it down specifically with respect to hard labor may be a bit of overdetermination. But I mean, I'm always reminded of things like, uh, and, and, and Rabbi Endelman can back me up on this, I'm sure. Um, the standard rabbinic complaint. What's this Shabbat day of rest? Everybody else is resting, but I'm working. And there you have it, you see, because what the rabbi is doing is sacred work. It's avodah. It's analogous to what took place in the tabernacle. Or um, you, you could be more quotidian about it, and you could talk about um, uh, the way women in traditional households, quote, unquote, enjoy the day of rest by spending their entire day cooking, cleaning, and serving. Uh, that again is uh, a form of avodah in the sense of both, uh, I suppose, religious devotion as well as hard work. And it seems to run contrary to the, the notion of Shabbat rest, which in traditional terms is pretty much defined as what men don't have to do on Shabbat rather than women. So that's, a, but the way you put it, I have only just added a few glosses to it. 
Thanks. Anything else for now? Yeah. Um, you, you just had you just got me thinking about Moses in terms of you know both of those um, right the liturgy calls Moses and Evan Neaman a faithful servant and and it's and in really any position of communal leadership as you were just alluding to it's both holy work and really tough really tough work with the people um, servitude and and service um, someone asked about um, a connection to uh, to Adam's punishment. Um, of having to kind of work all the days of, of his life for having eaten from the tree. Um, do you think that, that that filters into into this the avodah in these sources or, or generally how, how it's understood? That, that's such an interesting question that I'm going to have to refrain from trying to answer it now because it would be a shame to do that on one foot. Uh, but it, the idea of the requirement of working as a punishment rather than as an opportunity is an unfortunate way of thinking about it, but all too many people do. Uh, and it's generally true of the so-called curses following the sin in the garden in Genesis three, that what you do is you have the reality of our lives, which mean that we have to toil for our well-being, which means that women, uh, uh, have grievous pain during childbirth and, and, and suffer enormously in many cases, even dying. Uh, that these are a consequence rather than reading the uh, story of Adam and Eve in the garden prior to the so-called fall as representing a kind of uh, ideal that no one has ever experienced, but that people naturally yearn for, right? Being able to eat food and bear children without hard labor, uh, these represent uh, uh, utopian visions. And the uh, way to read the uh, Bible with respect to those is uh, to read these ideological or explanatory narratives as reasoning backward from our actual condition to what we wish might be or what could be, if only. Uh, there are other aspects to it too, which is, you know, the idea of reward and punishment embedded in that story and uh, the notion of uh, human responsibility for actions, which is embedded in that story and about a thousand other things. So uh, shall we return now to our text? Um, okay. Yes. Or one more? Hey, I'm, 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 maybe we can just squeeze this in. Um, someone was curious to know how, how you would classify uh, the work of actually, uh, you know, um, professors like yourself or lawyers or other people whose work is not um, kind of physical in, in nature and some of the way right, where you were talking about malacha as a product. Is that avodah? Is that malacha? How, how would you uh, how would you view those things? Well, I, I mean, for me, it's malacha avodah. I mean, as soon as as soon as I uh, see smoke starting to come out of my ears and I know I've been working too hard. Uh, but uh, it's, it's seriously, people equate, as one of our sources did, hard labor with physical labor. But anyone in the academic or uh, service or uh, other professions like medicine and uh, law know that their work is, is damn hard, even though it may not take its uh, obvious toll on their physical bodies. It's nevertheless uh, it's very hard work that arises out of the skill that they have. And I would argue that adamantly for teachers. I think one of the things the pandemic has done is has, it has given people a much greater appreciation of the physical toll that skilled work of the sort performed by teachers and, and medical people actually takes physical and psychological. Uh, and uh, anybody who hasn't appreciated that and witnessed it just hasn't been paying attention. Thank you. So, uh, so here's Rambam on Mishnah 215. And I wanted to give you the Arabic uh, along with the Hebrew. Uh, this is the original here, the Arabic. And you see it's written in Hebrew characters. That's why it's called Judeo-Arabic. The Judeo language is a uh, 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 native native language 
spoken by Jews and re represented in Hebrew characters rather than its native script. Uh, and uh, this is the medieval translation, some attributed to Shmuel Ibn Tibon, others just declared to be anonymous. And this is what you would find on the pages of your Gemara, is the uh, 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 Hebrew translation. So when he talks about 215, and particularly when you get to something like, you know, the master of the house is pressing, he declares it to be figurative language. This is mashal, in biblical Hebrew, mashal is a proverb. In rabbinic Hebrew, mashal comes to be a kind of uh, example. Uh, in medieval Hebrew, under the influence of Arabic, it becomes a figurative expression, a metaphoric expression, or literally a parable. And there's the Arabic cognate, which is mafal. So it's a parable about the brevity of life, the copiousness of knowledge, and the negligence of people uh, in seeking it despite their abundant, abundant award for it, and despite the urgency of the law and its commandments concerning the pursuit of learning. And the terminology that's used in Arabic is terminology that's inherited from uh, Muslim intellectual life. Of course, this term knowledge, realm, uh, which is translated nicely in the Hebrew as chokhmot, plural, because realm is one of those uh, nouns that's a singular collective like deer, doesn't have a plural. So it refers not only to knowledge in general, but also to the sciences from which one can attain knowledge. Uh, and I think Rambam intends that way. And the negligence of people with respect to uh, searching for knowledge or seeking knowledge. And there's this work, uh, the word, you can, if those of you who can read the Hebrew script will recognize the same root as the root of the Taliban, uh, Taliban, you know, who are the students, the seekers of knowledge. And that term comes up again. Uh, and this represents, this is a common Muslim term too, which is um, talib, talibu ilmi, which means seekers of knowledge. So that's the way Rambam describes these people who are seeking reward, which is mandated by the Sharia, which is not the same as Akhtaura, but is a more generic term for the law. So the law and its commandments tells us that we should, we should be unseeking, un, sorry, un, uh, 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 unstinting in our continual search of learning and knowledge. And that brings me to my favorite of all commentaries on Avot, and I, I take joy in bringing it to you because I kind of suspect that not too many people would be familiar with this. And this is the Sefer Musar, a book of conduct, some might say book of ethics, by Joseph ben Judah ibn Akhnin, who uh, was born in Barcelona and eventually made his way to Fez. His dates are uncertain. And, and you would have to number him among the, the finest or perhaps the finest disciple of Rambam. He inherits Rambam's uh, intellectual predispositions and thus in my mind spells out uh, many of what Rambam leaves kind of elusive in some of his commentary. And this was published for the first time in the 20th century, in, uh, you see Berlin in 1910. And another uh, characteristic that Ibn Akhnin shares with Rambam is that they wrote uh, in bilingually. They both wrote in Arabic and uh, in Hebrew. Uh, Rambam, of course, wrote his philosophical work, The Guide of the Perplexed in Arabic. And uh, the inquirer, the perplexed guy who requested it of Rambam was, you guessed it, Joseph ben Judah ibn Akhnin. So when you uh, read the guide as an epistle to one of his students, this is the very student for whom uh, Rambam was writing. Uh, and uh, uh, Rambam also wrote his glorious code of Jewish law, uh, the Mishnah Torah in Hebrew. So. Uh, the same thing is true for Joseph ben Judah. Uh, uh, I knew him uh, mainly from a uh, philosophical allegorical commentary that he wrote on Song of Songs in which he describes three different methods of biblical interpretation, the literal, the homiletical, and the philosophical. And that's an important precursor to what emerges later in the later 13th and early 14th century 
as the four uh, uh, ways of interpreting scripture that arise out of the mystical tradition uh, in Girona in the mid to late 13th century. But Ibn Akhenin anticipated that with three levels of interpretation, the third being the philosophical allegorical, which he takes up from Rambam, who never wrote a full commentary on any biblical text. So here's, uh, I just um, um, pasted this from the printed edition, uh, rather than, I don't think, I don't think there is any electronic copy available. So first he quotes the Mishnah, obviously, um, and you've already seen this above. Ah, this means, I just breathe a big sigh for dramatic purposes. Now, you're just going to have to take my word for this. This is beautiful, highly literate Hebrew in which practically every word alludes to something biblical or something rabbinic or something Maimonidean. And it's a joy to be able to read this Hebrew and I highly commend it to everyone. And it's also a tour de force of learning. So the days are too few for the attainment of all the sciences and disciplines. Just figure out how to translate all these different words. Chochmot, Madaot, because they're immeasurably vast. Every science is as immense as the earth and as broad as the sea. If the pious Hippocrates, I bet you didn't know him as one of the Jewish saints before, but there you can see uh, Abu Karet, except it's spelled without the Vav, that's Hippocrates, Hippocrates the pious, um, and that's how he was known in many Hebrew treatises. Um, I don't know exactly where Hakatsin comes from, but I'm just, I left it untranslated. That's the best thing to do. If the pious Hippocrates said this about the work of medicine, how much more so Torah, the act of creation, Masei Breshit, Masei Merkava, Lo Kol Isn't that even more so? And of course, those of you who know anything about Maimonidean language will know that when we talk about the act of creation, the act of the chariot, we're not talking about ancient Jewish mysticism. We're talking about uh, Greek physics and metaphysics. And so, uh, in other words, he's talking about the study of philosophy in conjunction with the study of Torah. So he really has already combined philosophical learning with Torah learning by using the Maimonidean uh, allusions to the study of philosophy uh, through Masei Breshid and Masei Merkava. Ibn Akhenid explains that the laborers seem lazy because they encounter the sciences in a complete state, replete with commentaries on every matter based on inquiries and researches of the ancients. We should follow the ample example of the industrious ant in Proverbs chapter six, verse six, uh, following Lech el Namala, go look at the ant and see how they prepare themselves for the bad season and so forth. Regarding the knowledge graciously transmitted to us by the ancients, as a gift to us. So just think about this for a moment. How do we know anything about medicine? Well, we know anything about medicine because it's been transmitted to us from generation to generation. So what's there left for us to do? Well, the first thing we should do is not regret the fact that so much has been passed on to us, but rather see that as a gift of God, graciously transmitted to us by the ancients as a gift. So what they were thinking was, it's impossible that there will not be in succeeding generations of seekers, wisdom and lovers of reason of knowledge, Dorshei Chokmah. See, that's just the Hebrew version of, uh, 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 in the plural of uh, Talibu Arilmi, the Arabic that Rambam used. The wisdom they left behind is their divinely inspired legacy to us. And this isn't just Torah learning, this is everything. Great reward is attainable by those who emulate them, engaging ethically in the study of the sciences. 
Bidarchei Hayosher, just like they did. So, uh, I mean, one way of putting this is to say that the sciences are provisional and always in need of further amplification and supplementation, as, as one might say the same for Torah learning. And when we come to our, whoops, sorry. When we come to the key statement, which is, what does it mean to say, it's not up to you to finish the work? Don't say, I'll press myself exceedingly in study like corvée workers with an assigned task to complete. Don't be like Moses. Don't be the people who stay up day and night and don't engage in the ordinary operations of life. Because if you do, in the end, you'll diminish your retention, become careless, and cease working. This is just such an extraordinary uh, uh, testimony to an Aristotelian view of uh, work life. Okay, so, shelo lifchot koach haguf, velo yamod chashash shema yale b'dadcha shetit atzel b'limud, v'tanu achrov shenotecha, b'machavcha, v'mashkecha. Don't, don't uh, diminish yourself by weakening yourself, becoming careless and ceasing to work, those who exceed the limit of their capacity will end up detracting, detracting from it. In other words, more is less. You'll exhaust yourself. You'll ruin your acuity. You'll douse your flame. Your soul will become too careless to inquire. You'll weaken and you'll give up. But that means don't give up. Because you recognize the limitations of your capacity, that's not a commendation to laziness or giving up. Don't neglect learning and spend most of your life eating and drinking with your spouse. You're not free from obligatory study and action. Rather, follow the middle course between the two extremes. Ella, haloch baderech ha'emtsait ha'memutsa'at bein shtei ha'ktsavot ha'odefet this is the most wonderful Aristotelian statement, statement of the Aristotelian mean as a guide to life that I know uh, from the Maimonidean tradition. Right there. It's not up to you to finish the work, but you can't cease from doing it either. That is a way of saying steer the middle course, not to either one of the extremes, but rather to this uh, extreme, as it were, of moderation. Devote most of your life to intellectual endeavor and relatively little to bodily needs uh, uh, and, and refreshment. He continues by arguing that the highest level of piety may be attained only by adhering to the meat. Ain adam yachol liga lezo hama'ala, rotzel omar, derech hachasidu. The highest level, which is the way of chasidut, the piety, ad shemagia el hamaala shelafaneha. You have to get to the prior level, which is aderach emtzayi, the middle way, the way of the mean. That's such an extraordinary statement, and in a world governed by extremes, it's useful to hear this again and again and again. Uh, I once again, I. I'm, Happy to uh, stop for questions and comments and uh, welcome Rabbi Andelman back. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Let's just say um, more than one person said they would have been happy to hear you sing earlier. Um. <laughs> you can sing that too, Julia, better than I can. Thank you. Um, Okay, um, so one person was asking about the, the source you were just teaching. I'll just read the way they phrased it. Is this teaching the source of the idea, or I guess maybe connected to the idea of leaving things partially undone to avoid arrogance? For example, getting up from Shiva before the end of the last day. Oh, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Um, I wouldn't make that connection, but, uh, but, 
my dissertation used to advisor advisor used to love to say anything is conceivable once someone has thought of it and so uh, just like the previous questioner about adam and eve in the garden and the function of work as a consequence of the sin in the garden this is a wonderful thing to think on so without going into detail i want to thank the commenter for that remark all right um a few people have asked about retirement um in various stages thus far and i think um i'll, I'll read the way the person who raised it most <clears throat> most recently articulated it when one has retired from their occupation um sorry that's the wrong one what about retirement if we are told not to weaken ourselves by overworking are we permitted to retire after a lifetime of work um i'll, I'll leave it there well i mean that's a wonderful question i mean the work-life balance and the need to keep oneself active and sane uh doesn't abate just because you've uh, experienced that life change. I mean, I could adduce the example of my own mother, who, uh, when I was growing up, was what we used to call back in the day, a housewife. Of course, we all know that housewives aren't working, right? They don't work. Uh, managing a household and bringing up kids is not work. It's uh, just a form of servitude uh, for which you're supposed to be grateful. Uh, I, uh, stop me from being ironic anymore. Uh, but uh, the point is that she was frustrated, like many people, going through that uh, stage of her life um, without employment and, uh, you know, without having any sort of career path. And uh, she started to seek elsewhere after the kids left the house. Right. That's uh, so. In other words, she retired from being a housewife because we, we were all no longer at home. My father was a hopeless workaholic, so you know he would turn up from time to time, but uh, she didn't have to spend much time tending to him. So what did she do? First, she got herself certified in early childhood education at uh, a local university, and then she took a job as a preschool teacher, uh, which lasted exactly a year because she had pneumonia twice that she caught from the kids. That didn't work. Uh, so then she decided to. Uh, turn her hobby, which was needlecraft, into a malacha. Hello. So here was this person who wasn't working, quote unquote, because she was a housewife and had this incredible skill, this malacha, which was her needlecraft. And so she, along with my sister, who majored in uh, what was called home economics in college back in the day, went to work uh, in the field of needlepoint and other needlecrafts. Ultimately, opening their own shop, a knitting shop that remained a successful business for more than 35 years. And I think it uh, provided a whole new life for my mother, a career for my sister, and um, uh, uh, kept her uh, both physically and mentally alert in a way into her 90s that uh, nothing else could possibly have done. Now, I realize I've just answered the question by not answering it, but reflecting on a personal anecdote. But I don't think retirement means an end to anything. It means a transition to another way of thinking about the balance of your uh, intellectual and physical endeavors and your, your other, the other things that you feel uh, pressed to do, obligated to do, and the like. It's a beautiful question. Thank you. I think directly um, related to what you were just saying, um, someone else who brought up retirement, you know, asked about um, about you know, should we be distinguishing the, the, the same way we talk about work life balance, right? When you retire, there's hobbies and volunteerism and and support for your you know supporting you know kids and grandkids if that's relevant, um, as opposed to um, you know just chilling, relaxing, going on vacation, um, resting on Shabbat. Um, I think that's that's connected to what you were just saying. We can still have um, different parts of ourselves, and maybe there's there's a less um, there's a less extreme, or maybe the work part is more pleasant, right? We've we've chosen it at that point, but there's still kind of um, two aspects, uh, two distinct aspects of how we're spending our time. 
Yeah, yes, I think that's nicely, nicely put. And the Aristotelian idea underlying it is that you should do what's within your capacity. One thing that's really gratifying is when people turn uh, with uh, to Jewish learning uh, in later life as retirees, something that they felt they never had the time or the opportunity to do. I mean, we all know the stories about the uh, uh, people whose uh, Jewish intellectual life uh, ceases around the age of 13. And then be, they can become great experts in other fields of endeavor while not having the time to continue their Jewish learning. Uh, and it's uh, for many people a source of regret. And, and the thought is, well, when I have time, I'll come back to it. And amazingly enough, some people do, which is gratifying to people like me. I mean, after all, I make my living teaching these people. Uh, but more seriously, it really is a wonderful and gratifying thing. And uh, if it's fulfilling, how much the more. So thank you. So let's get to the third part of this talk, which is what's the underlying problem? And uh, I wanna start off with a commentator I'm sure none of you have heard of, uh, Matityahu Hayitzhari, <coughs> who says he's here Spanish. Um, but he really, I think he was born in France. His dates are not known, uh, but he was a considerable figure. He was a prominent student of uh, Haskai, Haskai Kreskatz. He was a uh, colleague and companion of the greatest Jewish philosopher of, of, of the generation following Kreskatz, namely Joseph Albo. He was a, a participant in the disputation of Tortosa and uh, had, uh, many other uh, exceptional achievements. Uh, he also, for fans of Psalms commentary, wrote an entire commentary on the longest Psalm, Psalm 119, uh, that is almost as tedious as the Psalm itself. But, uh, but some different strokes for different folks, right? Some people like Psalm 119. So here's Matityahu Hayitzhari. He was a philosopher and a great uh, scholar of Torah. It's not up to you to finish the work. Even though the sciences are intertwined, hachachmot, nikshorot, zo, bazo, until you get at hayidiyah elyona, supernal knowledge. You can see this is a 14th, 15th century guy because he's conflating philosophical language with mystical language. So, I mean, what's our goal? Whether we're mystics or whether philosophers, our goal is to attain the highest knowledge, which is knowledge of God. What's the path that we're gonna follow in order to attain this knowledge of God? Well, you can engage in mystical contemplation if you like, or you can become an astronomer, which would probably have been Rambam's advice, and learn of the necessity of God from the laws of planetary motion. See what I mean? In other words, there are many different paths that lead to Rome, to this tachli, to this ultimate purpose, which is the attainment of knowledge of God. And that's what he's talking about. But, does that mean that your whole life is worthless? If you've engaged and worked hard, whether in the uh, scientific disciplines or in Torah learning, and you haven't arrived at this ultimate goal of attaining knowledge of God, do not think that what you have attained is vain and false. Not so. Ella, call darush vidarush shehisagta hu hit atzmutcha. I just love that word. You don't use that uh, every day in modern or even medieval Hebrew. I translate it as self-improvement, but it's self-strengthening. In other words, okay, see, I haven't attained knowledge of God, however you would define that term philosophically or mystically, but you have, what you have done is you have strengthened yourself by the goodness of what you are doing. And who in the with Neasmo, that's a value, meaningful in itself. And you're going to get a reward for that according to God's reckoning, that the language is so wonderful. To Kabel Pras, Ba'ado, Lafi Shikul Ayit Barak. You know, 
it, it's not like you're going to submit an invoice. It's God's going to decide what you merit. And since the mission has told us that this merit may not be actually enjoyed until the um, uh, next world, well, okay, you, you have to just trust on the reliability of your employer, and that's God. And uh, that's probably a good idea anyway. In the Ethics of the Philosophers, I saw, I'm sure this is a book you all know, what this is, in case you were ever wondering, how did Jews know Aristotle or Aristotelian philosophy or come up with, uh, with, uh, with philosophical apophems? And the answer is that they had these epitomes or these summaries or these collections that in many cases might have descended from Greek to Syriac to Arabic to Hebrew, or there may have been other me media of transmission as well. And they arrived mainly bodlerized and with all kinds of uh, pseudo statements attributed to the great philosophers that they never actually said. So when uh, a Jewish thinker quotes a Greek philosopher, you have to find out what source that thinker was using and not assume obviously that it comes straight out of the low edition of Aristotle or Plato. So this is a treatise uh, that, that in Arabic was composed by a man named Hunayn ibn Ishaq and it was uh, translated by none other than the great uh, poet and philosopher Yehuda al-Kharizi the author of the Tachkamoni. So he now says that according to the sage, quoting the sage, the sage is always Aristotle, I do not seek wisdom in the hope that I will reach the end and attain its goal. I, this, is, I, this was so hard to translate, I did it about 20 times and I'm not sure I've got it even yet. Rather, I seek that of which I must not be ignorant. Let that sink in for a second or two. I seek that of which I must not be ignorant. There is nothing more fitting for a maskil, right? That's an intellectual, than that. And then Ad Khan, that just means end of quote. Isaac Abarbanel. I think I've spent my life trying to figure out what I'm ignorant of and then trying to fill those gaps. But the trouble is, first you have to find out what you're ignorant of. Remember the unknown unknowns? Well, there you go. Isaac Abarbanel. Uh, I mean, the great uh, uh, philosopher, scholar, you name it, just, you know, the great whatever you want to attach to his name most especially renowned for his career uh, in Portugal, a bit in Spain, and later in Italy, following the expulsion of the Jews from the Iberian Peninsula in politics as a, a financier and as an advisor to rulers. So here's a Barbano, uh, who wrote an extremely prolix commentary on uh, Avot. Uh, in this case, he gives us two different ways of reading the Mishnah altogether, and this is just the introduction to the first one. And what he does, first of all, as a good critical reader, is he wants to put Rabbi Tarpon's sayings in context. You can return to a comment that I made about them in uh, uh, the beginning of this class, which is to say that they seem a little bit out of place in uh, a chapter of Avot that is mainly devoted to the sayings of Yochanan ben Zakkai, Rab, Rabbi, and his immediate disciples, of whom Rabbi Tarfon was not one. So Rabbi Tarfon's sayings were brought here by the editor, Mim Sader HaMishnah, that's Judah the Prince, Yudha Hanasi, in a traditional understanding, Kedei Lahachria Bein Da'at Rabbi for Rabban Gamliel Duna. In order to Decide between the respective opinions of, of dad and son, right? Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai and his son, who is the first Rabbi Gamaliel. Rabbi's opinion was that Lo yitzdarech chol ben Yisrael ki imli shtadel ba Torah 
Bu Mitzvot. So this is this doctrine that comes to be known later on as the self-sufficiency of the Torah. All the sciences, all the disciplines, everything you need to know is somehow contained within Torah. And all that you need is derivable from Torah study, from Torah learning, eschewing any work in the, uh, what we might call the secular disciplines or the sciences or the uh, 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 other intellectual disciplines such as you know mathematics and astronomy and medicine and the like. You don't need any of that. What you need is the learning that comes from Torah. A very uh, extreme expression of this opinion also can be found in the writing of disciples of Ramban, Nachmanides, in the mid 13th, the late uh, uh, mid 13th, the early 14th centuries, particularly the greatest of his disciples, Bachia ben Asher. Um, in the introduction to his Torah commentary, uh, Bachia emphasizes at length that all knowledge that people can acquire is already contained, perhaps in some encoded fashion within the Torah. So that all Jews requires exertion in Torah and mitzvot without any connection, so philosophical ethics, philosophical conduct, which I take to be a cipher for um, the secular disciplines, that is to say, the supererogatory disciplines that don't emerge directly from Torah and Torah study. Now, the Hayadad Rabban Gamliel, so the opinion of Rabbi Gamliel, his son, was Sheshnei Hadrachim Tovim, Talmud Torahim Derech Eretz. And uh, you're probably familiar with that phrase. So both paths are good. Yaf, uh, what is the word that he uses? Sheshnei um, Hadrachim uh, Tovim, uh, good, Talmud Torahim Derech Eretz. And I continue to insist that Derech Eretz is not limited although Barbanel seems to think that it is, solely to the study of supererogatory ethics, but more generally to disciplines that lie outside the frame of traditional Torah learning, worldly knowledge. So the various statements by other sages on one side or the other, that is to say, reading systematically through Avot chapter two, which we don't have the time to do, um, lead to Rabbi Tarfon's concluding sayings. So, so after mentioning the supporting opinions, the editor brought the opinion of Rabbi Tarfon, which is but although it is true that it's very nice to combine Torah study with worldly knowledge, so if you assign highest priority to Torah study, then the limitation of our lifespans and our capabilities mean that uh, if you spend your time on other disciplines and studies, you'll be wasting time that you should be spending on Torah study. Now, why should you be spending time on Torah study? Well, first of all, it's enormously vast. And here we see a quotation that recurs again and again in the literature, that it's vast and it's long and it's broad. And chokhmat hamidot, that is to say, the sciences of virtue, namely ethics, are similarly vast. And given human indolence, there's no doubt that one cannot learn it all. So in other words, it'd be good to learn it all. I used to keep a list of the recordings that I wanted to purchase for my record collection. And um, uh, my brother-in-law, who sometimes helped me to acquire some of the things on the list, noticed after several years that the list never shrank despite the acquisitions. And uh, uh, when he finally said to me one day, well, what is it that you really want? I say, well, that's easy. I want the complete everything. So here we, I, I exclude some composers from that. But this is it. You see, there's this kind of ideal goal that's completely inachievable by anybody. But you keep in mind, I want to complete everything. I want to know everything about the sciences. I want to know everything about philosophy. I want to know everything about Torah. 
So how do you decide? Well, according to Barbanel, Rabbi Tarfon gives us the basis for deciding, which you can either accept or reject. That is to say, you can accept his interpretation or not. I like Ibn Akhmi. I like the idea that one should steer a middle course and devote <laughs> plenty of time to Talmud Torah without forsaking the rest of this beautiful world of science and discipline and everything else that can be called malacha, leading to skill and craftsmanship. Okay, so Rabbi Tarfum continued, according to Barbanel, that for the study of Torah, there is great reward, okay? Um, uh, that's a categorical statement of a barbanel that flies in the face of the Maimonidean, Aristotelian, and Ibn Akninian uh, mean that says one should give due balance and due consideration to everything that's out there to learn, while admittedly giving priority to Torah learning, because that's A, what makes us Jewish, and B, uh, uh, an important means for us to attain salvation. But uh, this is a categorical assertion that there's no reward for studying anything but Torah. I don't see that as a necessary interpretation of the Mishnah, and I certainly don't see it as a guide to life, despite all those yeshiva bakers who are laboring despite the pandemic in basements without masks. All right, so Yetzemi calls that, and what emerges out of all this, So, and I think that's as a general statement true. Don't waste your time on stuff that's of no value to you. I would not confine what's the value to Torah study exclusively, but I love the general proposition. Don't waste your time on trivia that are of no value to you, whether it has to do with attaining reward in the hereafter, or whether it's just for the purpose of achieving fulfillment of yourself, perfection of yourself as a human being. This is decisive support, he says, which I happily am I'm happy to disagree with, so in other words, the idea of the self-sufficiency of Torah and uh, the exclusion of all other forms of learning, given the brevity of our lives and the great reward that we receive only for Torah study, that proves that Yochanan ben Zakkai's position is more correct than the position of his son, Rabban Kamliel, again, in the face of Rabban Gamliel's statement, as well as the Aristotelian elaborations of it in the lights of Rambam and Ibn Akhenin. So there's your great question. Remember, I started this section by saying that this is the underlying problem. What is the underlying problem? And it's the old Torah Umada problem the relative place that uh, Jewish learning and observance and uh, worldly learning and worldly engagement uh, have in relation to one another. How do they fare relative to one another? And again, my preference for the Aristotelian mean, finding the right balance, each of us having to find the right balance for what works for our own lives and our own families and our own communities is the way I see as essential uh, and also as respectful of the panoply of sources that deal with our Mishnah. So I think that's a good place to stop. And I turn once again mm -hmm. to Rabbi Andelman. If there are any further questions and comments, I'd be happy to take them up. Thank you. Um, so there's a question from uh, someone who um, teaches seventh graders who prepares them for B'nai Mitzvah. And um, she was describing how, you know, she, she tries to, she prefers to see kind of like a less bifurcated um, or, or kind of message, a less bifurcated view of, you know, like your schoolwork versus your bar mitzvah work, bat mitzvah work and, and what those symbolize. Um, but for the kids, 
it, right, it's self-evident to them that that they're that the academic, the schoolwork they're doing has ongoing relevance. And yet with what she's teaching them, they they kind of turn off and, and move on after um after B'nai Mitzvah. I mean, you referred to this before. It's a problem that we're all familiar with. But it's um it's to me, really, the question I'm thinking about this in terms of my my son also, who's who's nine. He, he so it's not about bar mitzvah, but he sees his schoolwork the same way. It's like he's convinced that the math and the reading um, is going to matter down the road, <laughs> and and you know I know that um, most likely the Judaic studies that he's doing is is going to be core to his life in a much more enduring way. Um, so how how do we? I don't know how we, how we communicate that, right? The writers of these sources, it, it's it's clear to them that right the centrality of, of Torah is clear to them in a way that it's it's hard to communicate. No matter how wonderful a, a teacher or or rabbinic parent <laughs> you you may be. Uh, that's a, uh, it's a wonderful comment, and of course, um, my heart goes out to anybody who has to teach seventh graders. Uh, I once was in a position uh, when I lived in um, uh, Ontario, uh, I lived catty corner to the synagogue and uh, I was always being summoned to teach one group or another. And one year I was pressed into teaching a post bar and bat mitzvah class. Let me just say, so we're talking about right seventh graders, maybe an occasional eighth grader. And uh, let me say that it was the greatest failure of my academic career. No matter what I tried to talk about, the kids didn't want to talk about. Finally, I said to the students, well, what would you like to do? And you may have to be Canadian to understand their answer. And they said, let's go to Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons is the donut shop that is on practically every corner in Ontario and elsewhere in Canada. And there really was one on the corner, uh, uh, half a block from the synagogue. And I said, okay. And so every week we would talk about some Jewish topic, you know, without any particular organization, uh, but uh, we, had, we got along fine for the rest of the semester. And it just cost me a few dollars a week in donuts. So I was able to accommodate that. But back more seriously to the question, I mean, I think a lot of this, first of all, hey, come on, I mean, look at the culture we live in and people are so surrounded by secular blandishments and by uh, uh, dubious uh, claims about Judaism and about what they, what they should value. Uh, my notion is that the best we can do is try to impart skills to kids when they're young enough to be able to learn them. And then assume that there's gonna be a hiatus between when they acquire those skills as kids, when they're able to absorb them and when they're actually gonna put them to some use. It may be when they get married, it may be when they have kids, it may be later, maybe when they retire from their work. But if you, um, if you inject those skills and basic learning into their brains about uh, it's the ability to read Hebrew, basic knowledge of the Jewish calendar. Uh, I don't try to teach seventh graders values. It's a completely worthless. And anyway, you, you can't possibly, if, unless you're a seventh grader yourself, you can't possibly empathize with the worldview of uh, middle schoolers uh, as I was unable to do for the brief moment that I was trying to teach them. So, I mean, I'm not really answering the inquiry uh, of the uh, person who spoke, who uh, addressed you. But what I am saying is that if we're gonna uh, try to provide Jewish educations for our kids at all, it should be skills-based and um, uh, impart to them the ability to uh, reactivate those skills later on, like, um, you know, kids who grow up in a multilingual family who may never use one of the languages that they hear as kids, but then all of a sudden, you know, they go to visit Kazakhstan and hey, I can understand some Kazakh because I learned it in my home as a kid and it gets reactivated when you go out there. Um, 
Sorry, I should be doing a better job of answering this question. No, I, I, I love your answer, actually. Um, <laughs> it, it's a, I'm just going to speak personally for a second. So my, my son goes to an Orthodox school, which I, I never thought I would send a child to an Orthodox school. And people ask me why. And the answer is exactly what you're saying. It's because of the best Hebrew immersion school in, in our area. And I'm, I'm blessed to live in an area with a lot of Jewish day schools. Um, and and I was given that same gift um, by my father, who who spoke exclusively Hebrew to me. And how how um, how could you possibly sow skills for Jewish life more deeply than than um, Hebrew fluency? So I feel affirmed <laughs> by what you were by what you were just saying. Um, so purely on a personal level, I want to thank you for that. I, you know, someone has observed um, that part of the problem. I I, I agree with this is that. Right. Unlike the sources you've shared, we don't believe in the same, most of us don't believe in the same kind of um, heavenly reward, <laughs> like the stakes, um, the stakes are different. I, I think that, I think that does, um, I think that does play a big role. Um, I, let me say one thing about a comment you made in passing when you raised this question, which was about what the guys whose commentaries we looked at today took for granted. Um, I, I would say that they're engaged in polemics. That is to say that they are living among Jews who by and large are not engaged in any serious study and see no value in it. So what they're trying to do is hold out the ancient Mishnaic notion of the reward that awaits you in the world to come as a means of persuasion. So it's not as if they're living among like-minded people who all share this value and spend all their days in the yeshiva with them. On the contrary, they're desperately trying to persuade people of the value of engaging in Jewish learning and Jewish living uh, when they, they discern the slippage every day in their own communities. So th thank you for bringing that up. I'm glad I had a chance to address it. Um, I'm, this is my own question. I, I've always read that that um, passage from Pirkei Avot, Lo Alecha Hamlecha, ignore it's not on you to finish the work, but you have to um, keep chipping away at it as being about, um, and what we would say now, tikkun olam, you know, like kind of um, addressing addressing the problems out there in the world, um, which is not not a reading that you shared um, today. And I wonder if if you think that's a misreading or what's what. You, um, what's your own reading? Um, my, my own reading is very much attuned to the notion of social justice and that lo alecha ha malacha more read in that context is supposed to be a, an antidote to discouragement about how much needs to be done and how little each of us as an individual is capable of doing. I would, I would, uh, I might even go so far as to talk about the difference between culpability and responsibility. Uh, and I can reflect on uh, one very powerful interpretation of the book of Job that came, was published first in 1948 by a philosopher named Paul Weiss. And later it was um, reprinted in a book. This will tell you a lot about the author that was called The Faith of a Heretic. Uh, and what Weiss observed, I think he drew this difference for me. So what's Joe guilty of is the question he asks. And that's where we get to the difference between two different forms of guilt. On the one hand, guilt for a specific thing that you've done that you must repair or that you have to regret having done. And finally, responsibility, which you share with everyone else in the world, even though you may not have been directly responsible for it. So uh, I'm responsible for climate change, even though I drive an electric car and I recycle. I am not free of guilt for what's happening to the earth, nor am I free from the responsibility of taking whatever action I can to alleviate it. So I think that's where you're going and I'm, I'm there too. 
Wonderful, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I just, I actually meant to say earlier, um, so we can't address it now because we're out of time, but um, but someone did make a beautiful comment about um, about Torah study really parallel to what you're saying that, um, you know, maybe we shouldn't only be focusing on um, each of us individually on the work of Torah study that we that we need to be committed to, but what we need to do as a community to enable you know, enable Torah study, make Torah study possible for everyone. Um, I love, I love that we end, ended the series with your teaching today. You know, we started with, um, you know, kind of thinking very broadly about how we understand work versus rest. And then we've explored, uh, we've just explored so much, you know, um, ancient and medieval and modern Jewish professions and, um, how does God spend God's time? What work does God do? You know, as a way of thinking about our own um, our own hierarchy of values and um, labor movements, we've we've examined so many aspects um, of work in the Jewish um, imagination and experience. Um, and I love that we just stepped way back to think about. Um, work in the broadest sense of what we're what we're here to do and what our what our core and highest obligations are. So thank you for for finishing this series in such a beautiful way. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us. And I forgot to say earlier, our spring series is on the theme of emotions. You will hear more about it soon. It's going to be wonderful. Um, thanks for joining us on this journey of exploring. Uh, the topic of work and we very much look forward to learning with you again in the spring thank you once again to our sponsors as well um yale aspel and the eight bears and uh, to dr cooper for teaching all the best to everyone